you cannot say he's a murderer. Only you can say he touched the seeds. Welcome to the global phenomenon, surviving the survivor, where we're all just trying to survive in a rough world. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, where we bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. And I've never made that statement uh, more a statement of fact than today. Uh, this is one truly special guest, the University of New Haven's Henry C. Lee College of Criminal Justice and Forensic Sciences is named in honor of him. Dr. Henry C. Lee is the world's most preeminent forensic scientist. He's consulted on more than 8,000 criminal cases in 46 countries, including the O.J. Simpson trial and the Jean Benet Ramsey murder investigation. Dr. Lee, who joined the University of New Haven's forensic science program decades ago, helped build it into one of the top programs in the nation. He previously served as chief criminalist for the state of Connecticut and director of the Connecticut State Police Forensic Science Laboratory. And as if that is not enough already, he has edited and written several academic journals and authored or co-authored more than 30 books. So while you're sitting on your behind at home, Dr. Lee in his 80s is still working away. Uh, Dr. Lee, thank you so much for joining us. It's a, a true honor. Uh, I hate to start with this. First question to you, has this country just become too violent um, just in the last few days? Um, unfortunately, your community has been targeted in both Southern and Northern California. Uh, what was your reaction to those two mass shootings? And back to my question, are we too violent now? Yeah, uh, that's an excellent question. I wish I can answer it. Generally, we face so much problem in recent years. Global warming, flood, earthquake, inflation, pandemic, all those are become a factor in fact are psychologically and physically and mentally. Many people were looking for a different way to handle those stress. Do the reading or pick up a hobby. But some other people cannot take that kind of stress. Plus, the media sensationalize those serial killer, mass killings. For example, your talk show, it's really good to talk about the fact, but some twist the fact or make up the fact, not change the people's attitude and thinking. They put the violence as a way of express their feeling. Um, it's too big a problem for me to tackle, for you to tackle. I'm a forensic scientist. I just look at a, how to investigate the case, how to examine the physical evidence. And you, you didn't start as a forensic scientist. You're actually the youngest police captain in Taiwan's history. You came here in 1965 with 50 bucks in your pocket. I have, I have less than that right now, by the way, and I have three kids. Um, how did you segue into forensic science after already accomplishing something uh, like you did in Taiwan? Uh, that's, I started my career in 1958. You want to attend a police university. In 1960, uh, I worked in the police department. Early days in the 60s, we solved cases by interrogation and confession. So I start thinking there must be a better way to solve the cases. So I start interested in forensic science. But in the 60s in Taiwan, in Taiwan, we just learn simple fingerprint technique, crime scene technique, or two mark, shoe print. So I decided to come to the United States to pursue my study. 1965, I come to US. To my surprise, I found out 
in that period of time, the United States also rely on confessions and interrogation technique. There are no doctor degree in forensic science. So my doctor degree actually in molecular biology from University uh, NYU. Then I, after I graduate, I joined University of New Haven with my colleague and friends. We started doing research, trying to use scientific ways of the cases. By 1967, 68, Governor um, of a Connecticut offered me opportunity to join State Police Lab as their director for Connecticut State Police Laboratory, also as chief criminals for the state of Connecticut. So give me a chance to use my knowledge, what I learned, put into practice to build a forensic investigation from the bottom. We built a laboratory from 17 troopers to about 100 forensic scientists. When I left the you know, uh, state police laboratories. And uh, now there's a whole institute at the University of New Haven named after you. The president there, Stephen Kaplan, Dr. Kaplan, uh, wrote, few individuals have had such a lasting influence on the trajectory of a field as significant and groundbreaking as forensic science or on the reputation and success of an institution as Dr. Lee has had. Is he telling us the truth here, Dr. Lee? Well, oh, <laughs> uh, he's a good friend, and uh, we've been working together for almost uh, 20 some years. I've been teaching for 46 years at University of New Haven. Uh, three years ago, I retired from University of New Haven. We, I only work with some colleagues uh, on the, the issue of the Institute of Forensic Science. That institute is not the academic uh, unit at the University of New Heaven. However, we specialize in training for the law enforcement officer, lawyers, judges, uh, train them the newest developing in forensic science, also the technology in crime scene investigations. In addition, will provide scholarships for the student to major in forensic science or criminal justice issue. We we'll provide internal opportunity. Uh, we also provide the visiting scholar program for different countries. So over the year, we've been training over 10,000 uh, forensic scientist students come from all over the world, all six continents except uh, Antarctic. And uh, I still don't see you in your uh, golf outfit. You're still in the turtleneck and jacket. I know you're not on the golf course. You already told me that you had a, a Zoom call, a two-hour Zoom call, so you're not completely retired. I heard you tried to retire about five times, and it just doesn't hasn't happened. But I think when something oh. is your passion, right, it's something your passion, then you stick with it. Yeah, well, well what's the definition of retirement? <laughs> retirement, it's... Not say you don't do anything. You just retire from your previous uh, job, uh, profession. You put the, not the full stop, just a comma. You pursue other interests. That's why I wish all the senior citizens, so-called retire, they should come out of the wood and work it, helping the younger generations. Like I, every year, I do a lot of pro bono talk to high school students, try to work with them. Many high school students I talk to, now they become judges and uh, police chief. Uh, one of them become a chief surgeon. They come to, back to see me, Dr. Lee, you changed my life. So retirement, it's not just play golf and uh, sit there watching TV, have a glass of wine. Uh, just we do a different thing. Instead of a, we have to pass the baton to the younger generations. When I retire from the 
forensic laboratory. The younger people take over the lab. When I retired from the state police, I was the commissioner. I passed the baton to the next commissioner. Now the University of New Heaven, I passed the baton of professor, chair professor, to some other faculty. I'm just helping the community. And uh, that's why you talk to me about the cases. I said, I don't take any active cases now. We only assist the law enforcement or victims' family on cold cases, on solvable cases. Because victims' family are waiting for years, years for justice. They think the police are ready, law enforcement are ready upon them, the whole society upon them. Therefore, we have a call case center, provide some hope, helping those victims. Uh, what, just what like is, a, your organization, survivor. You know, they survive, we have to give them more strength, more energy to helping them to work with them. What has, um, I know you're going you're gonna to laugh at me when I ask this question, but you came in 1965. Can you name the single biggest change in forensic science in that time? Is there one thing that you can point to? Uh, of course, you talk about DNA. In 1965, we work on APO system. Blood type, type A, type B, type O, type AB. So whenever we found a biological sample, for example, a rape case or homicide case, we type in a blood type. 1965, 67, we started using isoenzyme. Then by the 70, we started using serum protein. So by late 80, DNA entered the field of forensic science. Now DNA become the most important single piece of uh, evidence in law used to solve cases. And I'm glad you mentioned that. We've been covering a case here about these four Idaho college students. They were ages 21 and 20, uh, brutally murdered on November 13th. It was DNA, touch DNA on a knife sheath that mm -hmm. led them to their suspect, whose name is Brian Koberger. I wanted to get your take on this. I know, uh, you know, you haven't been on the news. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'd like to make a little correction. Yeah. The knife sheath they found. It's father's DNA, not parents DNA. Correct. Okay, um, it's, it's father's. Also, that DNA is 90% match his father. That's not really a good figure. Because human with chimpanzee, our DNA, almost 93% similarity. So a lot of important issue the public uh, did not understand. Even you found his DNA on the night sheet, you cannot say he's a murderer. Only you can say he touched the sheets. Also, we want to know what kind of DNA from the blood, from the body fluid, or just a touch DNA. So, so the knife piece is a good, important piece of evidence. What they should do, look at the knife piece, find out the company. Hopefully the knife piece have a serial number. Then they can trace the knife piece. If you can positively say this knife was purchased by his family, or his father, or himself. Then you have a link. You just found a trace among the DNA doesn't really solve the issues. The real thing they solve is based on survivor, the two or individuals' statement plus the cell phone so-called artificial intelligence analysis of his cell phone. So 
Um, I guess I want to I want to clarify this with you. I, I guess I may may have missed my understanding was the touch DNA on the button of the knife sheath was from the suspect, but the way they traced it was through this garbage in Pennsylvania uh, that matched the father. Is that am I wrong about that? I don't know. I did not follow the case, but uh, I hear they found the garbage. Yeah, from the father's home. Yeah. Found some DNA. And compare the night cheese, identify that's his father's. Okay, maybe that I'm going to defer to you on that since you are the world's expert. So there's some more information um, that I wanted to get your take on. So um, for some reason, the coroner in this case decided to speak to the victim's father and explain the wounds to him. So he was in the media. Kaylee. Gonzalez's father, Stephen Gonzalez, explained that the coroner said to him, Sir, I don't think stabs is the right word. It was like tears, like this was a strong weapon, like not a stab. That was the coroner saying that to the victim's father. Um, first off, should a coroner ever be describing victims? Uh injuries to the victim's father and secondly what do you make of the fact that she allegedly said that they were tears not stab wounds okay um i don't know their policies okay but many times um corner have to talk to victim's family try to comfort them talk to them you can't just tell them, I cannot tell you. Usually, the autopsy report, the law enforcement already got it, the DA already got it. So, whatever the funding should be officially on the report. But generally, uh, we say sharp wound which is versus long object. A sharp can be a knife, can be a screwdriver, can be anything sharp. The wound, usually the textbook, we talk about three types. Stabbing, cutting, and chopping. But in reality, in my book, we put five different ways. Stabbing, Cutting, chopping, scraping, and slashes. Okay? So, stabbing usually means the depth is greater than the width. Cutting is the width greater than the uh, depth. Chopping is uneven. Some area and uh, the step is bigger than the other area. And uh, scraping, generally, it's just a superficial escape. Really don't damage the muscle or blood vessels. And uh, the tearing is basically emotion. Initially, maybe a stabbing or cutting or chopping, somehow the knife, because the motion or the knife, the rest is because the force, not because uh, original uh, uh, injury. The tearing, which has happened, all right? Uh, so I really don't know. I did not look at the helicopter before. I only can give you a general description of... Uh, different type of injury with a not pathologist view, a forensic scientist, investigators. And so just to round this out, the father went on to say that the coroner said to him, she said that these were, again, quoting big open gouges. She said it happened very quickly. This wasn't something where you were going to be able to call 911. They were not going to slowly bleed out. Uh, he also described how his beloved daughter's liver and lungs 
were slashed. When you hear liver and lungs being slashed, does that talk to the brutality of the attack? Very difficult to make an assessment just based on the description. Uh, to get to the liver or lung, which means the already have a severe injury into the inner cavity, body cavity, not just the superficial tearing or uh, uh, cutting. It's more like a stab than subsequent. So you have to look at a wound track to make assessment. Um, you have to know the location of this wound. How many are there? Uh, whether or not have the best one, how quick it's just one single wound or multiple. What's they, the definition of quick? When they look at these injuries, which they're obviously doing, will they know uh, the order of who was killed uh, first, who was killed last? Um, what will they be able to figure out from looking at the injuries here? Yeah, sometimes we can figure it out, sometimes more difficult. I don't have any pressing photograph. I don't have victims wrong, so I cannot really tell you yes or no. Good, honest answer. So there's a couple of other uh, cases a few people have heard of that you were associated with. O.J. Simpson. Um how do you feel about being associated with the O.J. Simpson trial all these years later? The uh, O.J. Simpson case, you know, initially uh, the prosecutor and defense, uh, prosecution expert, defense expert, we work together. Many cases we work together because the most important aspect of scientific evidence is to find out the scientific truth. We're not to look at a, to determine somebody guilty or innocent. Our job is to provide enough evidence, which we all agree upon. Because scientific evidence itself is one line. It's the people make the interpretations. You talk about what's the biggest advances since 1960, my answer, give it to you, is the DNA. But on the other side, even more important, before 1960, scientific evidence is only used by police. In other words, the laboratory all under the police. Uh, they so called matches. You probably know in recent years they start questioning handwriting, dental by marks, hair, even with fingerprint and ballistic striation comparison, who mark, shoe print, they all start questioning those. Are they matching or not? Even with DNA now. So matching is a word which has too many millions. In six days, matching means that's you. Today, we say consistent. Similar to. It's now no longer use match, that word, anymore. In addition, you found that some evidence early days were based on the so-called transfer theory. When Professor Lacar in uh, 18th century come up with this theory, when two things have contact, you have transfer. So if I found some blood stain on your shirt, uh, the DNA says somebody, which means you're guilty. But today, we start opening up our mind. In my book, we talk about linkage theory. In other words, they may have a perfect reason for somehow got the little blood stand on your shirt. 
in the dish you have so many things, situations called secondary transport. You go to a movie theater, you sit on a chair, got the hair on your pants. Just happened somebody, body was found in a parking lot. Not necessary you kill the individual. Just happened on a hair. That hair may be deposited on the that chair you sitting a day ago. With the modern transportation, all those populations start from the agricultural society to industrial to commercial, now the e society. We have to change our concept on physical evidence, not just find something somebody definitely guilty. O.J. Simpson is one of those type of cases. We found two types of issues, bloody issues at the scene. However, the prosecution said one, only one, O.J. Simpson. We documented it because I got to the scene. We found that a second time. It's not Bruno Margul. It's parallel on design. Initially, they say, no, Dr. Lee, you made a mistake. That's bumps on the cement. I say, English is not my primary language, but I do know what bumps mean. This is a super. Later, their expert con conceded. Yes, that's a super. So you have two bloody type of super. And, and, Which and that was us. It could be two people. And that and that was the theory back then. We all remember the famous line from Johnny Cochran, uh, OJ's defense attorney, if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. Um, and their theory that they espoused was that there was more than one attacker. And you are saying that you found a second shoe print. Um, all these years later, I mean, have you, have you ever, I, I don't know, and I apologize, have you ever gone on the record? Would you ever go on the record about saying whether you think he is innocent or guilty? I never say somebody innocent, guilty. It's not my job. We don't know. We don't know the whole picture. Unfortunately, many times, the police just let you look at limited amount of evidence. Actually, I have to, sorry, I have to make another correction, okay? Please, please. You're in Boston, right? Miami, yeah. Miami. Miami, yeah. okay. Well, yet not fit. You have to quit. It's not from Johnny Cochran. He got the credit, okay? Uh -huh. In 17th century, in Boston, Massachusetts, have a Sacco and Zabi case. 17th, 18th century, I don't remember exactly <laughs> here now. I'll look it up. Now that case, one major piece of evidence is a hat. So they put on the victim uh, suspect's head, say, that's your head, on that deceit. The defense attorney said, look, it won't fit. Well, it's not fit, you have to quit, but that had no Photograph, no picture. They have a cartoon jewelry. This guy has a big head and a head is small. So Johnny Cocker is more one man. This glove, actually the glove. People doesn't know that glove. All just look at a news media. See, that's a single layer laser glove. That's have a lining. You probably don't even know. I didn't know. Well, when I examine the glove, I know a lady won't fit him. But I don't know why the prosecution wants to introduce the glove. Uh, glove. It's a small glove. Inside, the hair we look at, it, it's not OJ, not consistent with OJ Simpson. So how did that glove get there? You remember OJ's hand caught? Yes. But the glove has no cover. 
So, so to this day, do you think the evidence still points to a second attack, to two attackers? It probably uh, indicates something. Okay, and uh, of course, this country, you have to prove beyond reasonable doubt. If you did not prove beyond reasonable doubt, the jury going to make a decision according what the jury did. Because I did not set through all the trial. I only testified the scientific evidence. What we found. I'm the one that DNA consistent with so did. That day the prosecution loved me because I look at it, that's OJ, there's DNA. But where that DNA come from? It's from the crime scene or from someplace else. The so verdict, the verdict was read in October on October third, nineteen ninety-five, and uh, still uh, questions linger. Not from some, but from some others, questions still linger. But then in March, let, let, let me ask you. Kennedy assassination, November 22nd, 1963. I re investigate that case. They have a second committee in uh, 19, well, in 1980, something asked me and uh, Dr. DeMille to re examine some evidence. We spent so many days look at uh, whatever remaining evidence. I cannot reach a conclusion. Is Lee Oswald the only assassin or have another second shooter? In this country, we have so many cases. We don't have a definitive answer. What's the problem? The crime scene wasn't handled correctly. If O.J. Simpson's crime scene handled correctly, we don't have the problem today. If Kennedy assassination, autopsy, and crime scene handled correctly, we don't have that. How did they screw it up in each case? What was that's the too long? To talk about. <laughs> Read my book. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. just going back to OJ for one moment, and then we'll. T I, I definitely wanted to touch on uh, JFK, so I'm glad you brought it up. The back in uh, 2016, not long ago, the LAPD announced that they thought they had new evidence in the uh, OJ case with a knife. What did you, what, what happened to that? What was the deal with that? Oh, that's a big deal. Uh, I got so many phone calls from media, <laughs> from uh, uh, police, from prosecutor, Dr. Lee, did they have I said, no, what that sort of, they found the knife. I was laughing, okay, uh, because I examined that night when they bought it. I'm the only one example. Because police searched OJ's house, say they did not find that Toledo night. He bought it. Therefore, that's the homicide weapon. They use a Deductive logic. Deductive logic work with shallow home. But in here, you cannot. You did not find it. Not necessary. That's the homicide weapon. Because the first medical examiner, Dr. Gomo, said two type of knife. <clears throat> they search. Garbage can. I forgot they found many knives that night, but nothing, not a single knife is consistent with what OJ bought. So the salesman gave a testimony about the knife. So many years later, they say they found a knife. That's a in his house. That's very important. But when we review this crime scene search, original crime scene, they did not take it. 
the Los Angeles procedure, major crime scenes, you should tape it. Why you don't tape it? However, subsequently, they searched O.J.'s house, they taped it. We saw one clip, shows the knife sitting on the bureau top. So I think uh, um, Bob Shapiro went to the house, got the knife, give it to the court. The judge sealed it. So nobody knows what in the Emily. When O.J. Simpson trial started, the homicide weapon, the salesman said that he saw that knife. So police assume that's the knife. The judge going to unseal the Emily. So prosecution, one the prosecution expert to examine. Defense said, that's our evidence. We want defense experts to examine. I said, I don't want to examine. Let somebody else say that. But uh, uh, in recent year, you heard a term called Grand Master. Court can appoint one person, both sides trust to examine. So somehow they met together. So the judge appointed me. As the examiner, they flew me to Los Angeles to examine that knife. The knife, we opened up, I opened up in front of the three judges watching. I still remember it's a Sunday. Initially, some of them probably feel what to examine. But after that, they all learn a lot. First, we look at a, any trace of a blur. Even a sticker, fifty nine ninety nine. I still remember. Stick on the knife, perfect, brand new. Then we're looking for trace evidence. Of course, I use cyanide filming technique. Try to look for fingerprint. We did find. Three partial print and the knife. The knife was resealed. The evidence submitted to the court. Both prosecution defense agreed based on my result. This knife never used. So that's why during the trial, never mentioned that knife. But so many years later, they say found the knife. Of course, later become a laughing stock. Turn on, the guy never really found the knife. He bought a knife. He wanted to put on eBay. The detective retired. He called his body, said, what OJ Simpson case number? His body asked me, him why? He said, let Construction man found a knife, give it to me, I kept it. So his body sell him out, held the captain. So instead of verify, they make a news announcement. And you were you were quoted in March 2016 of say, saying, How can you miss the knife? It's a big single-edged long knife, pretty sharp. <laughs> so you were incredulous that they were coming to you. There's no way they could have missed it. No, them the construction workers said, I don't want to use repeat the word he used. At work, he said, I did not farm this knife. I did not give him a knife. A reporter interviewed the construction worker. So you can see this case never died away. Okay. So it's kind of a, unfortunately, uh, our justice system uh, deteriorated, I think, over the year. Do you have people that are mad at you because uh, in, their, in their eyes you helped to quit what, what they believe, who they believe to be a killer? Uh, in contrast, only few. They know 
Paone Takabara Avenue. As a matter of fact, so many people come to see me, Dr. Lee. We understand your testimony better than anybody else. Because if two shoe print, I will tell you two types of shoe print. I cannot say only one. If the knife has blood, on our face for the report have blood. If no blood on there, I cannot make up. DNA is matched to this pattern. Okay, that's 99.99999. One in so many trillion match. Okay, that's what tell me it's his blood. But where the EBTA come from? In your bloodstream, my bloodstream, EBTA is a preserver, not supposed to be in human body. How can that sample have EBTA? So all those questions don't blame on me. If we do correctly the crime scene, this case solved a long time. Fascinating, fascinating. So, you know, there's a lot of conspiracy theorists out there that think... No, no, I'm... I'm not saying any conspiracy. No, theory. no, no, not you, not you. I'm That's getting... the defense attorney want me to say no. I said no, no, no. They must have a explanation. Yeah, could be a scientific explanation somehow, somewhere, but uh, we don't have the authority or call access to exactly yeah. the evidence. No. I understand you only follow the scientific evidence. I was getting back to JFK for a moment. There's a lot of conspiracy theorists out there who think that the CIA killed him. But the only thing you know is that you couldn't prove it was more than one shooter. Is that right with JFK? Well, there are evidence indicates Lee Oswald definitely involved. But whether or not have a second shooter, we don't know. Because the evidence wasn't preserved. The only piece of evidence we have, really have, is the Fruder film. That's because uh, somebody, an amateur bystander, took a videotape. Uh, that document, that tragedy moment. How many times have you watched that film? I watched quite a few times. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, the quality of the film, and uh, of course, if today the cell phones, they can capture really good uh, image. We can friend by friend study that. And uh, the Buddha film give us some indication. That's why we can. I cannot give you a conclusion. The final case, because I know your time is limited, I just want to get your take on um, Jean Benet Ramsey. All these years later, it was also, I believe, the mid 90s. Um, you were talking about handwriting evidence. Uh, there, there, there are people, a fair amount of people, who believe that that ransom note was written by the mother who has since passed away. Um, what did you find in that case, or better off, what did you not find to be able to solve this? Um, and do you think this case ever gets solved? Uh, I don't know either. Uh, I only looked at the scientific evidence. I wasn't involved in the investigation. I was called a month later. Uh, that note is three pages. First of all, three pages. It's not Henry. It's printed one letter after another, printed. So just look at that. If you compare with normal handwriting, with printing, that's apple and oranges. But the content of the letter, there are many issues. The star, so we are a large international periscope. We like your company, but not this country. 
pop up bottom, the ransom. I think eighteen hundred eighty thousand dollars or something. That type of writing is somebody have to sit there, spend a lot of time. Then found two practice notes in the garbage from the same pack. Use the same pack. With my experience, the ransom note usually one paragraph, couple of sentences. Not really that long. The case, I don't know, is a homicide or not. I did not give the opinion. Um, so, not much I can answer your question. Does it bother you, though, all these years later? No, I don't know. Been... I cannot make a, a so. As I said, I'm up already give you extra 13 <laughs> minutes. So I, I, I have to leave it. now. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. It was such an honor to have you on the show. Um, I, I read that you even carry uh, little police badges in your pocket. So uh, one day I'm going to come and uh, steal one of those to give to my son. But thank you sure. so much sure. for... Uh, for joining us on this episode of Surviving the Survivor. Love you, okay. America.